Your Royal Highness, ladies and gentlemen, it's my very great pleasure to welcome you all this evening on the occasion of the RSA's annual President's Lecture. We're honoured and delighted to be joined this evening by the Royal Highness, the Princess Royal, who is here to introduce this evening's event. The President's Lecture starts the beginning of our autumn season of events at the RSA, and they are live streamed, uh, and we hope that some of you might wish to join us uh, on Twitter, if you do, the hashtag is RSA President. I don't know if you've been a hashtag before. No. <laughs> <laughs> this evening we've brought together an expert panel to share their experiences of modern manufacturing. But before we hear from this evening's distinguished speakers, it's my great pleasure to invite you to join me in welcoming the Society's President, Her Royal Highness, the Princess Royal. Thank you very much, Mr. Hayward. And of course, this President's Lecture is not named after me. It's named after um, previous and rather more erudite um, presidents who were here a lot longer. But it is, I, hashtagging President, of course, it covers a multitude of sins, um, but hopefully it will mean something to the RSA members. Now, this is a, a, an event which uh, I've attended before, and it's always of high value. This is a slightly different format, and I'm really grateful to our speakers for joining us. Uh, tonight, and it does require a little bit of audience participation, although on second thoughts perhaps that's a dangerous thing to suggest to RSA members because we could be here all night. But I, hopefully this will be very much part of, of what we're hoping to do tonight. Reflecting as this discussion will, the, the very important new work being carried out by RSA's Action and Research Centre. And we're working very much with partners, and that's uh, a challenge in itself, but we've done so very successfully in creating a new network of make spaces, which we hope will very much change the way society designs and produces products and services. These remake hubs will bring together new digital and rapid bespoke manufacturing and efficient resource use through a circular economic uh, model. Now the RSA is developing uh, the hubs around the UK which will be purposefully designed to support a range of community needs from schools and colleges to business and interest groups to the public sector and policy makers and that mix will be different wherever you are. So that will require a, a, a local knowledge and a local input to make sure we get the mix right uh, for those hubs to really uh, mean something to those local communities. Uh, after, we will be an opportunity after this event to view some of the practical work uh, that's being done uh, that the RSA fellows and partner organisations are undertaking in this area. So th to give a flavour of what we believe is possible and what is already ongoing. And the RSA is, has vigorously supported design, invention and enterprise throughout its distinguished 250-year history. And it is committed to encouraging the technologies, industries, and networks that we need for a thriving 21st century society. It's a continuing, continuous and continuing process. We have to learn how to live with the changes that come around. And maybe this membership, given it the range of its knowledge and its involvement in development, is where an awful lot of these ideas can come together to encourage others uh, to look more proactively at what's on offer. So tonight's discussion is scheduled to explore these themes and we have an expert panel uh, to highlight the range of the innovative design and manufacturing solutions uh, already some degree of uh, knowledge. Will these new manufacturing technologies propel us uh, into a new industrial revolution? And uh, what will be the broader implications of our, uh, for our co economy and society? Uh, you might ask, what are the equally, are the unintended consequences of that kind of revolution? Anyway, I'm now delighted to hand over to Matthew Taylor, who would chair the panel discussion. But I would very much like to thank our speakers 
for agreeing to take part in this uh, rather unusual uh, pre President's Lecture. But we are very much looking forward to hearing your presentations on the future of making. And to thank you for, I think, volunteering to be part of the discussion afterwards. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Your Royal Highness, for an excellent introduction. And along with Vicky Hayward, I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening's uh, special event. Um, I'm also pleased to welcome all of you who are attending as well as our online uh, audience. Uh, before I introduce our speakers, um, I'd like to ask a favour of you. We heard at the weekend that a much respected colleague of ours at the RSA, Dr Emma Lindley, had passed away. And in order to show our respects to Emma, we are this week asking for a few seconds of silence at the start of our public events. Thank you. Thank you. I'll now introduce our distinguished panel. We are going to hear short presentations from each of them before we move to discussion. We are looking for your comments after they've spoken and questions in the room and via uh, Twitter. I'll introduce the speakers in turn uh, as they speak. So first, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Laura James. Laura is co-director of the Open Knowledge Foundation and a co-founder and director of MakeSpace, a non-profit community workshop in Cambridge. Laura has worked in high-tech research and development and with innovative teaching technologies. She's an alumnus of the Royal Academy of Engineering Leadership Award Scheme. She just told me a few minutes ago that she hasn't slept all week and has got jet lag. So uh, we're, we're on your side, Laura. Uh, please welcome Laura James. <laughs> The internet has revolutionized how we can share information, and it's now possible for anyone anywhere in the world to access the sum of all human knowledge. Everything from the latest medical research, the city bus timetable, how our taxes are spent, or how to bake a cake. And for instance, this week where I've been in Geneva with the Open Knowledge Conference, every attendee was able to find out how the Coke they were serving at the bar differed in its ingredients from the Coke in their home country, and to access the full set of ingredients and nutritional information for every drink at the bar venue. And such information about products naturally lets us start to think about information about manufacturing as well. Um, I think open data about supply chains, for example, means that consumers can understand the provenance of the goods that they buy. And they can have more trust in manufacturers and make more informed choices about what they choose to purchase. It also helps the engineers and the designers that are working on those products. It gives them the full set of information they need to understand where each component is coming from and how it fits into a supply chain. The transparency helps everyone. And this empowerment through information sharing, both finding information and sharing new things that we have learned and created, is also a key element of the grassroots maker movement. In hack spaces, make spaces, schools and homes around the world, people are creating designs and processes to build new things. They're sharing them online, finding designs online, modifying them, making them better, and sharing them back so others can benefit from that. We have websites designed to help us share software, such as GitHub, or 3D designs, such as Thingiverse, and lots more. And online collaboration is amazingly powerful. We see it every day. But face-to-face -face interaction is important, too. And physical spaces, like the make spaces that the RSA is setting up, are really key for that. They're incredible, bringing together local communities around tools and some shared values and goals to achieve all kinds of new innovation. Every, every makerspace is different. And the combination of tools, community, and sharing of skills is a really important one. That's what makes things happen. So make spaces bring together people from a lot of different backgrounds and skill sets. And they give them the space they, can, they need to share ideas, to share their expertise, to teach each other and learn from each other, and create new collaborations. Now, for all of the really interesting bits of innovation we think of today, whether it's medical devices, electric vehicles, wearable computing, each needs so many different specialities that bringing those people together in a space where they can collaborate from different organizations is vital, and makerspaces can do that. But makerspaces are not going to be producing high-volume manufactured goods. They're a place for prototyping, for experimenting, for trying things out and iterating and trying things again. And 
we still have a challenge, I think, in getting from prototype to a mass market product where something can really affect the state of the world. Our business environment today, still the patent system, our intellectual property system, is not really fit for purpose in the information era. It's going to have to change to make it easier for us to get great prototypes out into the market. We're going to need new business models. And I think the next era is going to be one of disruption and change as we work out how to move towards models there. I think part of that is ensuring there are good systems to enable new ways of sharing. It's easy to imagine that sharing is just, you know, you stick something online and anyone can access it. But actually sharing legally is a little bit more complicated. You want to make sure that people know they have permission to use the designs, the data, or the information that you're sharing. You need to put a license on it. And the Open Knowledge Foundation produces the open definition, which sets out what it means for something to be openly shared. And that means that that data can be used, reused, and redistributed by anyone, anywhere, for any purpose. That's the nature of open. And we have great licenses today for content, documents, and photographs, and for databases to help them be shared openly. But in hardware designs, in manufacturing processes, we don't have global standards for what it means to be open. We have different intellectual property regimes everywhere. And so there's work to be done there in getting those open licenses for different kinds of design work in place. It, it sounds like it's all about making new things but it's also about fixing old things, which is great for sustainability. Up in Makespace Cambridge, we got a second-hand lathe, and uh, when it first came, it had been living in a barn for a long time. It was missing all of the knobs, and the chap who was gradually repairing it and getting it set up, um, one day he stormed out of the workshop, and he said, I've got to keep turning this wheel, and I've just got this raw screw to turn. I can't stand it anymore. And he went to a PC, and he did a little bit of work. 30 minutes later, he 3D printed a knob that was a perfect fit for a 1969 lathe. He put it on and he could use that lathe and it was much better. And that was a real great example of the power of modern manufacturing. Simple piece of design, a custom part that did exactly what we needed. So makerspaces are shared assets, they're community run, and they mean that people have more access to more and better equipment than most people have elsewhere. Today's inventor doesn't need a shed. They don't need to sit alone and have their tools sit dusty and unused between projects. They can come to a makerspace where they have access to lots of tools and other people who understand those tools and can help them with their projects and potential collaborators to help them realize their ideas. We're getting makerspaces around the world, Africa, Latin America, and they're all connected together by people sharing online, finding things online, sharing what they've learned, sharing new things. I think ultimately the biggest challenges we face in realizing the potential of digital manufacturing technologies both in makerspaces and at greater scale are not really the technology ones. They're around people, helping very disparate groups from very different kinds of organizational cultures collaborate effectively together. And they're going to be about business models, making sure that we've got really great systems that let us ship goods and services that are going to be fit for the 21st century. So we're at the start of a revolution. We're going to need more engineering skills but people are already connecting together, online and offline, to share their skills and make this happen. I'm optimistic. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure that story about the lathe has fixed into people's minds and they'll all go home tonight and they'll look at some beloved old piece of domestic <laughs> appliance and think, my goodness, maybe I could repair this after all. Um, Alice Taylor is founder and CEO of Makey Lab, which develops network-aware, customizable toys and games that talk to each other. Alice was previously commissioning editor for education at Channel 4, where she commissioned multiple award-winning games and media, and Alice has a doll. <laughs> Please welcome Alice Taylor. Hi everybody. So uh, Makey Lab is a startup. It's about two years old and we went live with our first product last summer after having developed effectively what is a um, competent demo and then we put it out into the market, which is pretty much unheard of in the traditional manufacturing sector or system, if you like. So my background is pure digital. I come from websites and games and stuff like that. And in 2010, for my job at Channel 4, I was at the Digital Kids Conference in America, and this was co-located with the US Toy Fair, which is the biggest toy fair in the world. And I'd never come across, um, been to the toy fair before. And I was amazed to find that all the digital people were in the basement, in a little room, stinky room, uh, talking games, millions of users, you know, virtual worlds, Club Penguin, Washing Monsters, that kind of thing. 
And all the physical toys were upstairs, and they were separated by stairs and fire escapes and concrete. And I had that moment where I was like, I wonder if you can make a doll from an avatar using 3D printing. So I knew about 3D printing because of make spaces. Um, I've been watching these spaces mainly in the States back in kind of 2008, 9, 10, and seeing things like 3D printers. I'd seen a 3D printer, I'd seen a laser cutter, I'd seen how they work. And I'd seen that basically there was a common part there. There was a computer in the room attached to a machine. You did something on the screen on the computer, you pressed go, the thing turned up on the machine. <laughs> Holy moly. So uh, I came back and I did some sketches and I did some research and I found out that a hell of a lot of this stuff is patented and a lot of the machines are built in Germany and America and they've been suing each other senseless for 20 years. But the price was slowly coming down and the technology was slowly being democratized to the point where I thought, I'm early, but it's possible. So uh, I quit my job at Channel 4 and went and did this startup. And we make 3D printed toys that kids and adults alike can create using their tablet or their iPhone. So you take an avatar and you do your uh, customization process and a machine prints a little person that's completely unique to you. So these guys, so going back to how we're doing it, going live with a demo uh, is kind of horrific, I think, to traditional systems. Um, but that was last summer, and this summer we're in Selfridges. So the, what's happened in that intervening period is we put our stuff live. You know, last summer they were bone white, uh, not toy safe, you know, bald half the time. And early adopters turned up and went, oh, wow, you can do that. How about if you do this? And they gave us tons and tons of feedback, suggestions, suggestions for improvements, drawings, pictures. We had um, people turn up going, you know, you can make wigs out of wool and making us wigs and making us clothes and turning up with presents and ideas, furniture for dolls. And we've put this together and collaborated with our customers and we're still doing it. So we're a year and a half in now. What the biggest, most popular doll from Mattel, um, Monster High, took four years to develop from concept to shelf. So we're one and a half years in and kind of, I feel like because of this new technology, because of the democratization of information, because of live customer feedback and that kind of um, open sharing, we've done, we've kind of done this thing very, very fast. We just got a commendation from the uh, Independent Toy Retailers Awards um, in the dolls category. We've got over 10% of the votes just after one year. I mean, I, I still wake up every morning going, holy, it, 3D printing's amazing. <laughs> it's just amazing. And so, yes, I'm a complete believer that this is going to change everything for the better. Thank you, Alice. Uh, Dr. Julie Madigan is Chief Executive of the Manufacturing Institute. Indeed, she is the founder of the Manufacturing Institute, a different kind of making, uh, helping manufacturers to gain competitive advantage from high-impact skills building and productivity improvement programs. Please welcome Julie Madigan. Perhaps I just say a little bit about what the Manufacturing Institute is. Uh, we're a charity with a remit of education for the public benefit with particular emphasis on manufacturing. Uh, we've been around 18 years now. We've educated about 50,000 manufacturers in best practice and improvement techniques, largely based around things like Toyota production system to improve their productivity. We've actually worked on the shop floor with 9,000 manufacturers and have delivered over £1 billion of quality cost and delivery improvements in those companies. We've had 60,000 children through our Make It campaign, which is really promoting manufacturing as a career destination. And that just gives a flavour of the sorts of things that, that we do. Um, how this story began for us was with a phone call from one of my board members who worked in the aero industry, who had a lot of work going on with MIT in the States. And this is about five years ago now. He rang up very enthusiastically and said, I've seen something that's like a factory on a desktop. It's like the Starship Replicator. And I thought, hmm, no, what's coming here? Um, but what it turned out he'd seen was uh, the origins of something called Fab Labs, which um, is, is something which has spawned out of MIT's Center for Bits and Atoms. And that's basically where they take some, some of the technologies and the open source know-how that's coming out of that very innovative department and place it into communities to see what communities will do with this technology based on the notion that necessity is the mother of invention. 
At that point, there were about 35 of these fab labs, as they were called, placed around the world. And met Baz, who's already had one in Amsterdam at that point, but there was nothing in the UK. So a few years ago, uh, three years ago, we set up the first one in the UK, in Manchester, in East Manchester, in a rather challenged economic area in a regeneration zone. Um, Cutting to the chase, three years on, we've had 3,000 visitors. We've got 1,500 registered users of that fab lab. Um, and this is basically a facility where you can go and make your own stuff. So as a charity, we fund that um, free of charge to the public for two days a week where they can come in and make their own things. We have commercial terms as well so that we try and make some money to support the thing for the rest of the week and do commercial prototypes, etc. And we see this as an incredibly powerful mechanism for engaging a much broader community with manufacturing. One of the things we've been trying to do for many years is promote manufacturing as a career destination. Uh, people have a very, very outdated view of what it's actually like. I went into a factory recently where, I don't know whether you've seen in hospitals when you go in and rub the alcohol gel when you go into the ward, you usually get dermatitis. This factory's got five different types of gel in the toilets, all labelled up in a 5S system. And we're actually taking hospitals there to see the standards of what we call 5S and cleanliness that are far superior to anything that you might see in a range of hospitals that I could name. So, the public image of manufacturing hasn't kept up with the reality. We have one of the most productive manufacturing bases in the world in this country now. We've survived a lot and we've driven productivity hugely through the application of productivity improvement techniques like the Toyota production system, which is widespread now in manufacturing. So, um, it occurred to me that if we had 50, 60,000 children sitting in their bedrooms downloading things from the internet and making them, because I'm sure very soon everybody's going to have the must-have gadget of a 3D printer, it's becoming commoditized, that that could lead to all sorts of innovations and enterprises. It's lowering the barrier to entry for people into manufacturing. It's developing a new view of manufacturing that's far away from the one that's the recognized sort of media image that unfortunately we still see promulgated. And if there are lots and lots of these things all across the UK, whatever they're called, and members of the public are engaging with them, then that's got to be a good thing. So moving forward slightly, um, we've helped a further um, eight labs set up across the UK already. By the end of this calendar year, there will be 15 up and running. There are a further 65 that wish to set up. So if we think about the maths, if we each, each have 2,000 people engaged a year and you roll the plan over five years, then we're looking at a quarter of a million people engaged with advanced manufacturing, members of the public wandering in off the street, which is great for the image of manufacturing. It's also absolutely vital for the skills base in the UK. Um, we have a demographic time bomb looming in manufacturing. Average age of the manufacturing employee is 55. Um, although there's a good push on apprenticeships at the moment, it won't fill the whole, and I was talking to a large media organisation this morning, it's got exactly the same problem except their average age is 45, not 55. So we have a big deficiency of, in terms of the skill base that we need to make up in this country. And at some point, we're not just, it's not just about putting new people in, it's about converting people from other, perhaps lower value jobs in terms of gross value add into advanced manufacturing. So that's what we saw in it. We aren't out to control it. We're out to support and help others uh, set up and get as many members of the public engaged in this as we possibly can. The other thing that started to happen, which is quite nice to see, is that some products are coming out of the labs that are starting to get to market very successfully. One example is Nifty Drive. Um, gentleman who's 23 years old wandered in off the street looking to make a memory stick that was flushed to his iPad. We helped him prototype that. We put it on Kickstarter. Um, he got £453,000 of advance orders. That's now on sale in Apple stores. Unfortunately, he had it made in China. 
And this is, uh, as I see it, the biggest challenge, I think was alluded to by the first speaker, that we face now. There are four centres of gravity starting to emerge in this model. There's the ideas harvesting. Sorry. <laughs> it wasn't that bad. <laughs> There's, peop there's ideas harvesting, so there's models coming in like Quirky in the States, which has got huge venture capital funding behind it, which is basically taking consumers' ideas and harvesting them and then taking some of them through to market. And these people pay to submit their ideas and get a due diligence report back on it. So that's one sort of model. Then when you've got your idea, you want to take it to market, you get a prototype. That's the sort of thing a fab lab can do. Then you want to scale it up into manufacture. You might get your funding off Kickstarter or similar, which is the third leg of the four centres of gravity, as it were. But the slowest to come to the, to the process will be the manufacturers, I think. And there are a number of reasons for that. That, to me, seems the biggest and most difficult issue. And it's to do with capability and investment. That's the thing that really needs tackling. It also relates to that skills agenda. So, in all of this, there's a model that really plays to the UK's strengths. Some data that came out from Nesta, from work with MIT, recently showed that the UK has the highest incidence of what I call tinkerers, people that just make things for their own benefit, go into the garden shed because they want to make something. The guy that probably fixed the bolt on the, the old lathe is, is one of those. So if we can take that individualistic and innovative and entrepreneurial creative sort of drive and lower the barriers to getting businesses set up money prototypes and manufacture to me you've got a, an entirely new potential business model an economic model and it will be a delight to see that happen so we're about this new vision aligned to the uk's strengths but vitally it needs a system a capability uh, to support that vision, and that will be the most difficult part of the job. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Now, you might have been thinking that Baz van Abel is just our token man on the panel, uh, but he is a lot more uh, than that. Uh, he's the initiator and director of Fairphone, a social enterprise which is developing a mobile phone designed and produced with minimal harm to people and planet, Baz is co-editor of Open Design Now, which seeks to transform design into an open and shared discipline. So please welcome Baz van Abel. So thanks for the introduction. Actually, I, I, I've, what can I add to all these things? I mean, uh, you've put it really, really well, uh, all the changes that are happening and, and what, you, what, the, what the future can bring us. I think a lot of these things are actually also still uh, kind of uh, ambitions. Uh, what I see with Fab Labs, you know, I've been involved in Fab Labs for a long time, um, is that there's a lot of ambition, but there's also like this gap you still have into, you know, I'm a designer, and as a designer, I, I really like to think in the impossible stuff. But if you go and look into the impossible stuff, there's also these steps you have to make into, you know, in between to be able to get where you want. And I think, especially with the 3D printing, digital fabrication, all the new technologies we have, there is this gap. There's still this gap that we, you know, we know what is possible. We have all these ambitions, but we still have to find the right models. And it's also challenging, and that's the, that's the fun part of it, because we, we're dealing with an economy at the moment which is giving us the possibility to think about this, because we have to innovate. We have to go through new values. We have to go to you know, local values. We have to go through thinking together on, 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 on solutions, because we can't solve them, them uh, ourselves. And, well, like I said, my background is design. And as a designer, I think that I can actually change systems through making stuff. So that's just as simple as making something, um, a product, a phone, whatever it may be. Um, and doing that, by doing that, actually think bigger than just making that thing. Because if, you, if you're just thinking and making, and you're not thinking about the context around it, you're just you know, still in that status quo of this whole industry. Um, what I mean by that is that if you look at a product, and that fascinated me by, by running the Fab Lab for a few years, is that if you go through that lab, and normally what I do as a designer, I send this file to China, and then it comes back as a product. Well, you, you said something about that. And the thing is that it's not, it's not per se bad, it's the way our economic system has been set up for a couple of hundred years already. 
uh, division of labor, you know, it's, it's, it's all good. But it brings this kind of magic to it, uh, which, is, um, uh, which is ungraspable. It, it alienates me as a designer from, you know, from, from what, what the stuff I use. I, I don't think there's, you know, there's that many people here in the room uh, that actually know, for example, what this, how it's made, where it comes from, who made it, uh, you know, what, what people were involved, and where does it end up you know, after it's used. So running the Fab Lab made me understand that you know, there's much more to making a product than just sending a file to China. And I think that's the great benefit of having these labs. Because what we've done is to, you know, we live in these cities and we've kind of pushed away all these manufacturing to the outskirts. And then we've pushed away the, you know, the manufacturers uh, of the outskirts to different countries, other countries where they're you know, making our products. And we're not even asking that many questions about you know, how that's done. And uh, you know, we're talking about technology, we're talking about products, we're talking about resources, but we're also talking about human cost involved into making things. So a product is just a small part of what the product actually is. Basically, a product is part of a full economic system. It's the economic system that you have to change to be able to change products the way they're made. And the product might still be you know, looking the same, but at least you can say, you know, this product is made in a circular way. You know, you've been talking about the circular economy. So to be able to look at, you know, to change products and change manufacturing, you have to look at the circular model. So what we do, um, you know, after giving a bit of context about where, where I'm from and, and how I look at uh, uh, the design and the making part, is, you know, at a certain point, uh, a development agency came to us and they, they asked me, you know, boss, can you, can you help me with a, a nice campaign around conflict minerals? Conflict minerals are minerals being mined in Eastern Congo. Um, and these are being used in, in, for example, mobile phones and small electronics. And they asked me, you know, can, you, can we think of something else than the general you know, signature campaign? And we were thinking about that. And uh, after a while, you know, we, we came to a conclusion that if you can, you can create this campaign, but the problem is you don't have an alternative. So people might say, well, we want to have fair phones, but they're not there, so you know, what do you give them then? So um, then we kind of naively said, well, why not just make that phone ourselves? You know, phones are being made, it's not that hard probably. So, uh, so we took that step, we started making the phone, so I went to Congo, um, after you know, two months we made that, this is three years ago. Went to Congo to try to find a mine, fair trade mine, didn't exist of course. but. Um, we started asking questions, asking questions which normally people don't ask, like, you know, what, what do you need to make, to be, to make, to make, the, uh, to make more comfortable for you in this mine? What, what, you know, what do you think about fairness? How do you see it? And we went to the miners, we went to the ministries in Congo and asked, asked, asked these questions about, you know, what do we need to change as a company to be able to make a fair product? And we found out that, you know, it's not a fair product. It's not just a lot about minerals and the mining and how it's done. It's also about the Chinese factories, the working conditions. It's also about European factories, the working conditions. It's how we treat our waste. It's how we, you know, uh, have our software running, you know, the, the open source software. How do we make it in such a way that people can, can use uh, uh, that product also as a platform? So that's how we set up Fairphone. Uh, we, we said, well, we, let's, let's just do it. And we can't do it by ourselves, by ourselves and we start as a movement. And um, uh, after a while, we, we decided to set up a company because there were people asking, can we get the product? I want, I want to have the phone. You said you're going to build it, so you better make it now. And I'll, I'll be happy to put my money where my, my, where my uh, mouth is. So, so uh, you know, people started asking for the product, so we take the step to, to really do it. And in three weeks' time, 10,000 people bought this phone, which didn't exist. You know, which is being made by a company who never made a phone before. <laughs> so that, that was kind of a statement of people that they want to see things being done differently. I think if we really look at you know, wh where we're at in, in this whole development, is that digital fabrication and all these things around it, you know, it's not about the technology. It's about what it can give, what insight it can give us in the social aspects around these technologies. It, it creates meaningfulness in the stuff we use because we need different economic systems around that. And we started it, and actually I'm very proud because we're in London to, to actually show that we, we, you know, we have the first phones. So um, if you really go for it and we're making small steps, you can actually 
do it. And you can change systems by making products. And in a way, the product just becomes a means to an end. It's just a catalyst to, cre to create change. And that's what I really believe in as a maker. And I think making can actually catalyze this change as well from a very practical perspective. Thank you, Ben. Uh, I'm going to ask the panel one question, and then I'm going to open it up to you. So, panel, if you could respond uh, uh, briefly to this. Uh, it, it's kind of been touched on, but the excitement, uh, the magic, I think, Brad's talked about, that comes from making things, and particularly in relation to young people. Uh, I went back to my old school to do a speech today, and I remember, it's a long time ago, but I remember at that school there was a kind of view which says there were clever kids and there were kids who made things. Uh, do you think that we can overcome this? And do you think that the, the, the cleverness of this new technology, the way in which it can produce things which are amazing quite quickly, can be something which can make making a much more general experience, particularly for young people? Yeah, I think that making things is just intrinsically fun, and whether it's something 3D printed or laser cut or even something cut from a piece of felt, I think people get, you get a great buzz from making something new or from fixing something. I think it's just exposing children to the fact that you, they can do that, that it's possible, and that it's fun. Um, and I think that doesn't always happen in schools today, and I think the Makerspaces movement and other initiatives sort of help join the dots, get the people and the tools and the excitement together. Alice? Yeah, I mean, it's the new digital fabrication, there is no handmade stuff particularly. I mean, it depends. So we have both. We have advanced software specialists and we have folks making clothes and putting dolls in boxes. But at the same time, it's all software-led and software-driven. And we use agile software production methods, which actually lean, lean software came out of Toyota, Toyota's manufacturing system. Um, is it going to inspire kids? Uh, and let them do stuff. Yes, absolutely. It's a really, it's, there's a weird dichotomy because the new technologies mean it's a lot easier to produce something for the first time. Have a go, make a little object, which is that wow moment. But then to produce something that's safe and acceptable by consumers at a consumer price and in the system and distributed, etc. Distributing atoms is really hard. Distributing digital is really, really easy. So it, it, it's easy to make a physical thing, but it's also still really hard. Um, I, I think kids, though, will see it and they won't be held back because they'll see that they can get on the internet and figure out which level they want to drop in at. And if there's a little level above that they just, it just feels slightly out of reach, the knowledge is there for them to be able to teach themselves, Great. if need be. Thank you, Judy. Yeah, I think we've got the perennial problem of the sort of um, separation of thinking and doing, arts and science, and then we've got the class system working into the mix as well uh, in this, this sort of little arena. And that's one of the great things about Fab Labs, I think we can sort of cut through all of that because if you present a child with a problem, um, a child came in and wanted to make a singing toothbrush um, with an MP3 player embedded in it, doesn't sort of think about the separation of the activities. It's a creative process and then you go and find out how to do it and that involves actually making it. Um, so I think this is an absolutely wonderful platform for, for young people to engage. The 60,000 kids that have been through the Make It campaign have all been into manufacturing sites as part of the challenges that we run which are bespoke to each individual site. And we know from that that they're the data before shows 37% of them think they want to do manufacturing. Afterwards, it's 78%. So we know we can you know, show them reality and get a big change. But what we've started to do now is run something called Junior Fab Academy. And this is a sort of fairly unashamedly elitist activity um, around a sort of lower grade version of MIT's Fab Academy. And that's really started to pull in some what I would call posh schools um, who are taking a big interest in this. A lot of them are actually got, their kids are making 3D printers in their schools at the moment. And there's some really startlingly good innovations coming from 12 and 13 year olds. So I think there's, there's hope, definitely. And I see this as a major mechanism for sort of creating that inspirational pathway from classroom right through to the boardroom in manufacturing. Pat? Well, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, um, I, I, especially, you know, it's, it's a creative, and I, I'm talking, talking about my own experience as well there, that I think, I think the iteration between design and making is, is, is brilliant. You know, you, you, can, you can design something, think about something, and, 
and have these conceptualized uh, thoughts. You can even draw it or you know, make a technical drawing of it. But the real inspiration comes when you actually make it, and then you get feedback loops, and you go into. So it's it's you know we've done we don't we we we've, we look at creativity as being you know much more of a concept thinking uh, at, at school. I, I've been, I've I've done art, art school, and I think there it was all about you know getting getting the most brilliant ideas. But uh, I think most ideas actually come from the making process as well, and and that is uh, that's that's the great part about it. And uh, uh, we've, done, we've done workshops in our fab lab actually giving, you know, the uh, uh, people, you know, collaborative making is actually a very powerful thing. So you just get people, give them a solder, soldering iron and say, well, just, you know, you, you came up with this brilliant idea, so you have this brainstorm and you know, people have all these visions and futures. So, well, just make it then, this vision and future. And you just give them the soldering iron and say, and you see the CEO of a company like, but, but, but. But and, <laughs> and so and then and then then probably the you know someone who works on it like, come give me the iron I'll show you how and then then you got like this this totally new uh, way of working together and the same happens with uh, with kids the same happens with kids when they when you, you let them work together because it's 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 the make you know, through making things and through conceptualizing things and going back I think it's a, it's a very powerful process also for kids to work together. Great. Well, thank you very much. So. Uh, the floor now is yours for questions and comments. What I think I'll do is take uh, a whole group and then invite the panel to just pick out one or two points that they want to respond to before we uh, close. So let me start with the gentleman. Wait, could wait for the microphone. Wait, wait for the microphone to come to you. Oh. <laughs> there it is. It's My just there. Car. And tell us who you are. Can you hear me now, Pip yes. Callingford from St Albans? Now then. Um, that sounds like you're going to say something well, very long. No, but no. <laughs> it's, a, it's a holy place. Um, what I am missing is a bit of uh, specific gravity. I mean, I'll give an example. Windsor and Newton used to produce excellent notebooks, sketchbooks, little A5 ones, bigger ones, A4. Now they're all made in China and the things fall to bits. Now, how can what you are talking about get some decent books made. That's <laughs> as simple as that. Thank very you. good. Okay. Uh, very specific. Very good. Uh, there's a gentleman in the front row here. I hope you're taking notes. David Perry from the Commoner Foundation. I think my question really is directed to Julie Madigan and following up on what she uh, has said. And it's really a question of what we have to do, what is needed to reshore manufacturing so that we can have a future that takes all these things we've been hearing about um, in the uh, innovation stage come through into volume production in this country. Good, I think I saw, yeah, there's a, a lady over there. Bettina von Stamm, uh, and I'm absolutely thrilled by all the prospects that 3D, 3D printing brings, and I sometimes wonder what it will do to large corporations. Um, and in that connection also, my concern is about sustainability. Does it mean that every one of us can print their own things, that we're having even more stuff that ends up in landfill? Or what can we actually do to use this fantastic technology to stop mass producing and only producing the things that we really want or need? Very good. No such thing as an easy question at the RSA. Uh, oh, that that I can do that one. There we are. There's the mic. Derek Portsmouth, the life fellow, and feeling it. Uh, <laughs> on behalf, uh, Mr. Chairman, of the RSA Leicester Network and its case study into Aerofab manufacturing, can I suggest that if any of your panelists would come to Leicester, come on the shop floor, come into the factories, and see if they could help with concrete suggestions about improving competitiveness and doing a little bit better in what is our new homegrown uh, business environment which is really taking off. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad an Aerolab is taking off. Um, so, uh, oh, I think we have a Twitter question. Right, wait for the microphone. Um, we have a Twitter question from Alastair Scott, who says, um, looking forward 10 years, where will home or local community manufacturing be in terms of object complexity? Wow. 
I'm not sure I understand that, but it sounds fascinating. Um, and then we'll take the gentleman in the tie here, and one more, and then we'll bring the panel back in for comments. Hello, my name is Konstantin Prinz, and my question is to the aspirate. So I haven't seen a Fab Lab or a Maker Space before, so my question is to the aspiration level. Uh, the hype that is currently on seems to be about 3D printing, designing, and rapid prototyping. And, and I've, I've sensed a bit in, in Bass's and, and Julie's comments that the sending the file off to China shouldn't probably be the end of it. So my question is, what is the aspiration level beyond rapid prototyping into the uh, manufacturing stage? Okay, and then finally we'll take the gentleman who's sitting uh, here in the second row. For, for, um, Trevor Jones from Ohio. I would like to suggest to the panel that they use the, a platform, the manufacturing platform, as the point where science and design finally results in the creation of wealth, jobs, and improvement in the quality of life. Thank you. Okay, uh, panel, uh, a whole range of questions. Uh, we've got seven minutes, so I think that means you've got... <laughs> I did get a maths O level, so I think that's slightly less than two minutes each. So just pick out a couple of points. Alice, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, okay. I'm going to take the, um, the question over here first, which was about sustainability and landfill, etc. cetera. So um, just to reference our own product, my apologies for this, but the, the amazing thing here is that each of these is only created once it's created by the end user. So what we don't do is produce thousands and thousands that go on a shelf and then kind of hope that they're going to sell. Um, it's on-demand manufacturing, basically. So that helps to solve the sustainability problem. And not least, it's extremely efficient manufacturing with pretty advanced materials. This is just pure nylon, but a lot of the materials that are coming out are biodegradable and recycled products themselves. So it's a pretty uh, good future. I don't think we're going to see people just printing out lots and lots and lots and lots of stuff. Um, but if we do, chances are it'll go straight back in a hopper, get chopped up again, and go straight back through the machine for the next thing so that your little plastic My Little Pony becomes a spoon, becomes a pen. So no worries there, I don't think. Uh, what do we need? We need a ton more engineers, especially women. Um, we absolutely need education on this. And I'm not talking rote, gove, Bible, Latin stuff. I'm talking proper, hands-on, advanced, um, software-driven, creative, design-led education, and we need it fast. Um, object complexity, super complex, all coming. Aspiration level. The aspiration is, is it prototyping right now? The next step is, can you get that straight into the hands of consumers? So, yes, you can. Kind of, We're right out there doing that, just taking the product straight out of the rapid manufacturing machine and sticking it on the shelf and avoiding China completely and the manufacturing system, traditional manufacturing system completely. There is one bit that comes from China and that's the hair. Synthetic hair is now only made in China. I really want somebody to make synthetic hair from bamboo or banana. Please can somebody do that so that we can just cut China out completely. That would be fab. Thank you. Julie. Right. Um, the gentleman from the Commonwealth Foundation, the reshoring of manufacturing. I, I, I think this, this area of how to get traditional manufacturers more quickly into this territory is absolutely key and there are a number of obstacles to that. So let's just look at one example. I was in a small tooling company in North Manchester um, a few weeks ago and this gentleman had had to go into administration and phoenix out because he'd actually made quite a risky investment in rapid tooling uh, just at the wrong point when the recession hit. So this idea that the survival of the fittest you know, through the recession, it's not true. It's the people that actually took the risks and made the investment at slightly the wrong time that have been hit very often. But this gentleman remortgaged his house to buy his new uh, tooling machines and he knows that digital could put him out of business. Very well informed, goes to the trade fairs every year, looks at this coming and says this can't compete with us at the moment because of the degree of resolution that it offers. We go around the factory floor and he's got lots of widgets that he's making for automotive manufacturers. He does the proof of concept and then it goes off to China. Now actually for that gentleman there is a potentially different business model. If there's a different conversation with the supplier base, not about the transaction costs but about how rapidly he can get the tooling to support their manufacturing and new product introduction there's a 
approximate manufacturing model that needs to be put in place, a conversation that needs to happen. For that to happen, he needs to put investment in. So he needs to probably put about half a million pounds into laser sintering. Is he going to do that at the moment? Probably not, given where he is financially. But he's fully aware of the issues. Uh, so how do we get that investment in to that individual? And how do we get the skills relating to it? It's a big risk relative to the size of his business. There's different models that could be used. In, in Europe, uh, cooperatives are used. Because let's face it, if he's the only guy offering, offering a five-day lead time turnaround on rapid tooling, he's very quickly going to be loaded up, and then it won't be five days anymore, and it'll go off somewhere quicker. So you've got to have that overall capacity in the UK to be able to step up to reach this business model. I know there are initiatives coming out of biz, things like AMSKIT, etc. But part of the issue here is when to take the step forward in terms of investment in new kit and infrastructure structure and skills, it's an enormous risk to individual businesses. I think there have been some great things done with things like high value manufacturing catapults, but they are predominantly big company driven and some of those are already maxed out in terms of capacity. It's not actually getting to the small and medium sized companies. If we can get something down at grassroots level, perhaps through these maker space and fab lab structures that, that promulgates more to small and medium sized companies, and I think there's hope but the, the response has got to be commensurate with the scale of the problem. And so far, I don't think it has been, nor with the scale of the opportunity. Thank you. Bas, pick up one or two points. Uh, <clears throat> I'll pick one. Um, I think you know, the maker spaces, um, um, I think the gentleman asked, you know, what, what, what will 3D printing bring beyond you know, what, it's, what it's now? What will be the, you know, the next steps? And to me, 3D printing in itself is, you know, you can see it as a production by itself. And it's nice that it brings local production closer. It, uh, you know, it's, uh, the communication system around it is brilliant. You know, you can you know, th just think about being able to send every, everything everywhere and being able to build it. I, I, to, me, to me, that's not really the point. I think for maker spaces, uh, if you really look at, look at them and the 3D printing and the tools they bring, um, it's not about the tools. Um, it's about the tools enabling something else. Um, what they enable is actually so, you know, problem solving on a different level. It's the wicked problems we don't, you know, it's the social problems we deal with. It's not the very practical stuff like, oh, we need to produce so much and you know, how do the fat labs come in? How do we solve that? I think makerspaces, fat labs um, are brilliant places to go to and to really um, have our, our communication model we have now, information, sharing information. I mean, we, we, we're doing this all the time on, 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 online, and we have this brilliant thing set up on openness, mm -hmm. but we don't use that to produce our physical objects yet. And I think 3D printing is, 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 is kind of moving that forward, kind of closing the gap between how we can solve like, bigger problems uh, through sharing more things in the, in the physical world. So I, I, I don't, I'm not sure if it will, will ever replace you know, manufacturing uh, as it is right now, injection molding, you know, the, the procedures we have in place. It's just that it will drive another mindset. Thank you. And then Laura. Question about Newton's notebooks, I liked. Oh. <laughs> I've seen the Principia Mathematica in the University of Cambridge Library, the edition which is annotated with Newton's notations that became the second edition. I got to touch it, but no one else gets to see it. Today's scientists are creating live logbooks on the web. They're not just writing down everything that they, their insights, their equipment is capturing data and every bit of that data is instantly available to their collaborators around the world. A couple of months later, they've published something online, someone else has seen it, they're reproducing the results, they know what equipment was used, they can check stuff properly. Bad science can get rooted out and good science gets better. It's a new era. But if you want to come make a paper notebook, come up to Cambridge. We, we've got great paper. We can help you find a nice paper notebook. And, um, and anyone can make stuff. I mean, simple things like that, anyone can do it. Great. Well, thank you very much. I'm sure the panel all would like to come to Leicester, too, even though they didn't respond to that. Uh, um, but I don't want Leicester to feel left out. Um, I'm afraid we've run out of time, so I'm going to bring the session to a close. I want to thank you for coming and for an excellent set of questions. Um, I'm pleased to invite you to continue the conversation to drinks reception downstairs in the Benjamin Franklin room, which is immediately underneath this room, uh, where you'll have an opportunity to view 
uh, exhibits demonstrating practical examples of innovation in design and manufacturing. So the gentleman who never seen any of this happening, you'll be able to go and see some of it happening downstairs and have a drink too. Could I just ask you to remain seated until Her Royal Highness and our speakers uh, have uh, left the room. But please join me once again in thanking our fantastic speakers, Laura James, Alice Taylor, Julie Madigan and Baz Van Abel.